Daisy. And I'm Terry. And this is the Monday, Monday Mindset, Mindset Podcast. Podcast, where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 191. And today it is Terry's turn to share something. Terry, what do you have? Well, Daisy, I found a new to me podcast, certainly not a new podcast. Another new one. Yeah. You are on a roll this year. That's right. What I've done recently is I just kind of look at what ones they're telling me, you know, people who listen to what you listen to might, you know. Yeah, yeah. But this one definitely is not a new podcast because it has 751 episodes already. Blimey, that's a lot. It's called Life Kit from NPR, which is National Public Radio here in the US. The host of it, her name is Marielle Sagara. And this is an episode with a clinical psychologist named Jenny Tates. And I think there are some things in this episode that piggyback on things that you and I have shared in previous episodes, so just kind of pulling it together in different ways. I chose this episode because I thought, well, this sounds like something most of us would benefit from, and it is Soothe Stress in Minutes. Hmm. Always good, wasn't it? Adds in minutes on the end. (laughs) Not one of these take 10 years to do. So Jenny Tates, the psychologist that is being interviewed in this, has written a book called Stress Resets, How to Soothe Your Body and Mind in Minutes. And I guess in that book, there are 75 evidence-based tips to relieving or managing stress better. So it might also be a book that some of us are interested in as well. As they started talking, probably I don't need to give much intro as far as, you know, our stress response and how we deal with it often leads to some negative impacts for us physically, emotionally, mentally, and then even in our world, in our relationships, in our job, in our health, and so many things. So obviously you and I have talked a lot about stress in various ways and everyone I think is pretty up to date on the impact of stress. So talking about these stress resets in that they are quick ways to improve how we feel in minutes instead of lingering there and staying stuck in that stress response and then moving into maybe for many of us more problematic behaviors. Like if I stay in this stress response too long, I might start online shopping and spending excess money just to try to relieve that stress or I might eat problematic foods or or whatever it is, or I might, you know, yell at people in my life. So being able to respond to our stress more quickly can be really helpful. And they talked about three categories of resets. And the three types are mind resets, body resets, and behavior resets. So in each category, I'm just going to kind of tell what it's for. And then they just shared a couple of examples. So I'll talk through some of those. So in the mind reset, when do you know you need to do a mind reset activity? And that would be when you can tell that you're thinking in ways that don't serve you. Maybe you're perseverating on a negative thought, rehashing over and over, overthinking. Probably most of us can relate to this. And then the second type is body reset and the body resets target your physical experience of stress and trying to work at it from that angle. And then lastly are the behavior resets and these are meant to improve our behavior so that we don't act in ways that actually multiply or compound the stress. So let's go through each one of those. So how do you know when you need to do a mind reset? That's when you can tell that your thinking is kind of getting stuck. You're thinking the worst thought possible. You're catastrophizing. You're overthinking. Or basically, as um, Jenny, the psychologist, said, you're kind of drowning in worst case scenario thoughts. And again, I think most of us can relate to this. So they just chose three mind resets that you could do, but obviously in the book there are more. So the first one is name that emotion. So kind of noticing and labeling the emotion, like I'm sad. And then also even labeling 
how much intensity is tied to that emotion right now. I'm sad and it's at a level four out of 10, you know, so you can kind of do that. And I know that we talk a lot about naming emotions and identifying them. And oftentimes people think, well, that's so dumb. Why would I do that? I'm already feeling it. I don't need to label it also, but really it does a couple of things. One, as you and I have talked about in previous episodes, it can create a little bit of distance between you and that emotion because you're taking Mm -hmm. more of like an observer perspective. So it creates a little distance. And then the other thing is the act of naming it uses a different part of your brain and it disrupts our limbic system and that is our emotional system so we can kind of get out of that stress emotion and it allows us to activate our prefrontal cortex which is our more reasonable rational part of our brain so physiologically it changes how we're experiencing that so doing this naming of the emotion really can be an effective reset and obviously doesn't take any resources, um, doesn't take any money, and doesn't really take much time. Jenny, the psychologist, also mentioned that when she hears people talk about this strategy, she also encourages them to think about that when you identify the feeling, recognize that that probably kind of creates in you a magnet for thoughts that will propel that emotion. So for example, if I am sad, I'm a magnet to sad thoughts. So as those sad thoughts come to me, I can now hopefully put them into more perspective. It's almost like recognizing they're kind of, as one author in another category talks about, they're neurological junk. Mm. They're coming to me right now, not because they are the important things that I have to do. They're coming to me because right now I'm a magnet for thoughts that support this emotional response. So I think that's pretty powerful. It can help us put it into perspective. It's a bit like the Facebook algorithm. Click on one thing and then you'll get, like if you click on a fancy looking dog bed, you'll get 100 adverts for dog beds. (laughs) Absolutely. Another strategy they talked about is sing your thoughts. Mm -hmm. She said that this creates a cognitive diffusion where you're kind of interfering with those thoughts and getting them onto a different track rather than going down that rabbit hole. She described it as really kind of playing with your thoughts rather than taking them so seriously. And she and the host both gave some examples. I am going to spare everyone here. I'm not going to sing my oh, emotion. I was waiting for you to sing that. Yeah. But um, they gave an example like, you know, maybe you're sitting home on a Saturday night and your thoughts that start creeping up and the feelings that start creeping up are like, I'm a loser. No one wants to hang out with me. It's pathetic that I'm home alone on a Saturday night. So you could turn that into a song, pick, you know, maybe like a song walking on sunshine and use a phrase that fits the thought you're having, but to that tune. And when they were talking about this, Mariella, the host and said, yeah, I was just thinking that the other day after I read the book and she was thinking the thought, why do people hate me so much? So, you know, this is kind of irrational. It's not really true. It's overblown. But that was what she was thinking. So she thought of the song, Build Me Up Buttercup. And some of you, as you're listening, will start humming this in your head. And so What she said to herself as she was doing it is, you know, she substituted in her thought and she's like, why do people hate me so much? Singing it to that tune. And while she's doing it on the recording, she's laughing. And Jenny says, this is exactly part of why you do this. Mm -hmm. Because once you started singing this, it made you realize that that was kind of an overblown thought. And now it's kind of funny to be singing it. So again, just switching up the energy behind it can help. And so singing it. um, And then the third mind reset that they talked about is making a pie chart of your life. She said that, you know, you pick each area of your life and put it into the chart. So first of all, you're doing some, you know, cognitive work here, which again, uses a different part of your brain. 
And what you're doing is you're creating a pie chart of the different areas of your life. So let's say health, career, pets, relationships, family, exercise, whatever the important things in your life are. And then because it's a pie chart, you're really kind of designating how much value does this part hold in my life. So let's say the health part for you is 20% of your pie chart. Then when something goes wrong in one of those areas, you can kind of say, oh, well, that's only 20% of my life. Look at this other 80%. So it helps us again put into perspective when we're kind of narrowing in that this thing that's going wrong right now is just kind of seeps into everything to really, again, recognize, no, it's in one part of my life and these other parts of my life are okay or not in that same place. Then they talked about the body resets. You know, how do you know if, if you need a body reset? And she basically said, when you sense that your body experiencing the stress, for example, you know, you notice that you're walking around and your shoulders are tucked up to your ears. Well, you might be holding some stress or you notice that you're walking around with your hands clenched. For me, it's my jaw and my cheek muscles. I can tell when I'm clenching too much. So if you can tell that you're holding the stress, this is the time to do a body reset. One of the body resets they talked about is move your body in short, quick bursts. So for example, jumping jacks or something, just do something kind of, again, it changes the energy, changes the focus. But also what Jenny talked about is that it helps you almost recognize, hey, maybe I'm a little bit stressed because I'm doing these jumping jacks, not because I have to keep focusing on this other thing. So it can kind of help shift how we're interpreting the stress response. Another one they talked about reminds me of some things that you've shared before, Daisy, from an episode. And this strategy she refers to as expand your gaze. And when we are in this stress response, we tend to hyper focus and we kind of zoom in. And naturally, our pupils dilate and we narrow our focus. So we're, we're really only focusing on something. And if you think about it, physically, we're focusing on one thing and mentally, we're going down that rabbit hole. So it's this narrowing of our focus. And so we can help change that by working on expanding our gaze. The host of the show talked about when she did this, she had to kind of think of it as an internal camera in her eye and that she was opening the lens to see more. And then she started taking in the stimuli. And this is the part that you've talked about before to go with the senses, pay attention to three colors that I can see, three sounds, tastes, sensations on the skin. So again, not even just really your visual gaze, but your whole sensing gaze in a way, opening up and recognizing senses that are happening can get us out of that stress response. Yeah, something that came to my mind, actually, I'd made a note here to mention it later, but now's the time. I think it might have been, it might be a few episodes. I think there's something BJ Fogg does with fingers on his hand. It's the sort of five different things. But the one that came to my mind, I have a feeling it was Jewel, a very early episode, you know, the pop star Jewel. And Mm -hmm. she has like a a mindfulness and wellness and, and all that stuff. She suffered with real anxiety. I seem to remember a really interesting story. But yeah, she went through the different senses. It was like, Mm -hmm. name five things I can see, five things I can Mm -hmm. hear, five things I can feel, and so on and so forth. But just a really good grounding Mm -hmm. exercise. And you're right, because you have to focus on that. It takes the focus away from the other things, brings you back. Yeah, it helps you interrupt that flooding that we can feel Mm. when we're so narrowly focusing on a negative thought or a negative experience. It's almost like you can't see. It's almost like you kind of black out from your senses. And the whole goal here is to get reconnected to your senses, to get out of that narrow focus. So I think this one's a great one. And like you said, you've done episodes on it before, so... If people are interested, they can go back and learn even more about that one specifically. And again, it's really easy and quick to do. Mm -hmm. The next one they talked about, she refers to it as sigh it out. 
you know, doing a really purposeful sigh. And she described it as inhale through the nose and then inhale again and then exhale. And she refers to this as a physiological sigh and that if you do a number of them that you're doing kind of cyclic sighing and that this can really disrupt the stress response. And research has shown that folks who do five minutes of this deep sighing actually experience more positive emotions. So it doesn't mean only do it when you're stressed, but even doing it throughout the day, Mm. doing it for five minutes a day can help just kind of turn around some of our emotional responses. And you might think, why is that? One of the reasons that this can, can affect this is that the sighing helps us release more CO2, more carbon dioxide. The more carbon dioxide we're holding in, the more anxious we are. So allowing ourselves to do this physiological sigh can really help break that up. So I really liked that one. That reminds me about James Nestor. I think I've done at least one episode, him talking about breathing and nasal breathing in particular. And I remember him talking about, you know, everyone assumes with breathing, it's all about the oxygen, but it's not. It's about the carbon dioxide much more than it is the oxygen. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that ties in. And of course, he goes into great lengths and depths about it. So yeah, that definitely brings that to mind. Well, and also the idea that breathing in activates the sympathetic nervous system, so heightens tension and activates things, and exhaling activates the parasympathetic, the relaxing, the calming. And so again, breathe in, breathe in, and then a long exhale. Mm. So activating that system, getting rid of the extra carbon dioxide, all of these things. So I, I love that strategy. And and the host said, well, you know, the only thing about this strategy is you might not be able to do it so much around other people. And the woman did it on the episode. She's like, well, you don't have to do it so audibly that it's like no, in the no, middle of me okay. like, ah. though making the noise can also feel good but um you know so she did it during and she's like really it just looks like you're resetting with your breath it doesn't have to be a real obvious disruptive thing to people around you yeah and i remember someone and i can't for the life of me remember which episode this was but i do remember somebody else talking about specifically breathing for relieving stress and I think there was something about imagining as you're exhaling pushing those Mm -hmm. you know anything negative out at the same time Mm -hmm. so you can you know again it's tapping into different senses and Mm -hmm. and different sort of mindfulness aspects isn't it I used to teach people on the exhale to do a word like calm Mm. and you know There's something about the sound we create when we make that that is actually soothing or, you know, um, you could say soothe as you're exhaling. And again, it's just kind of reiterating that pushing out of that, um, releasing the carbon dioxide and, and visualizing it or saying something are great ways to do that as well. And then lastly, they moved on to the behavior resets. And, you know, of course, the question, how do I know when I need to do a behavior reset? She said, you know, when you are acting in ways that have future consequences, and she talked about it's like a high interest credit card. It's fine using it in the moment, but in the future, it really kicks you because of this high interest rate. And many of us find when we're in that stress response that we do behaviors that feel pretty good in the moment but bring us lots of consequences later. And you and I talk about this in lots of different ways, but you know, it could be um, like you cancel plans, like you're planning to do something and because you're in this stress response, you cancel the plan, even though you really would have enjoyed going if you had let yourself get to that place. But in that stress response, you, you jump to the canceling. You might be overly reactive and gruff with someone close to you. I, I would say that's probably one of my 
unfortunate ways that I do this stress response is, is I become less engaged. I become more sharp in my responses, more irritable. Um, overeating or eating foods that are really problematic for our health, spending money, retail therapy, those kinds of things. So you might want to do a behavior reset when your behaviors are packed with future consequences. So the, the three that she talked about, the first one is build a hope kit. And this might mean gathering images, photos, songs, trinkets, whatever it would be for you. But she said, you know, when we are focused on negative things and we're in that stress response, we get more and more focused on the negative. And often for us as people, this makes it hard to see that things are ever going to change. And that's really what hope is. It's, you know, that idea that it's going to be okay. Things are going to improve. Things are, I'm going to make it. And needing to build this. She talked about there's actually an app called Virtual Hope Box app. And again, they found that people who were using that experienced significant changes in how they were experiencing stress and how they were functioning overall. They both talked about some examples. Um, the host talked about, you know, for her, she has a couple of photos of like her friend's one-year-old daughter, there's this adorable photo of her, or you know, maybe you pick up some photos of your friends. I was thinking as I was listening to this, photos of us when we were at Keto Fast, something like that, mm -hmm. that it helps remind us that there are positive things in our life so that we don't stay in this tunnel of only looking at the things that aren't going well or don't feel good right now. The psychologist also mentioned that uplifting pictures can actually help reduce our experience of pain. And I know we talked about an ep episode about pain responses. So again, just creating this hope box, bringing these things so that when you're in this stress response, you can refer to it, you can actively do it while you're in the stress response. So that's one behavior reset. Another one is to do a good deed. Doing a good deed can be a really small thing like you smile at someone in the store, you know, so it doesn't have to be a, you know, 10 hour commitment or an every week commitment, or it could be, it could be something that you do, that you sponsor something or donate money towards something, or you donate time and volunteer or something. But the reason this can be so helpful with kind of changing the stress response and getting us into a better place is that, again, when we're really stressed, we often are stuck looking at what's wrong and we feel kind of powerless to do anything. You know, if there's something going on at work and you're like, well, it's the powers that be, I don't have any control over that. Doing a good deed helps kind of remind us you make a difference. Mm. Maybe you still can't control that specific situation at work, but you do have power. You do have agency and can do things. And this can help shift us out of that kind of doom and gloom, narrow tunnel vision. And then the last one they talked about, the last behavior reset is take one step forward. So doing the thing that you can do, you've mentioned BJ Fogg, we've talked about James Clear, all of these people who talk about habits and things talk about really recognizing the small steps. And oftentimes we feel kind of, it's daunting that we have this big thing that we want to achieve or tackle or get through. And instead of looking at the big end result, that if we just take, what's the one step I can do? And she talked about when she was writing the book, she interviewed a police officer who had actually been shot in the face and was in critical care at one point and kind of asked him, how did you get through that? How did, I mean, that's pretty stressful and, mm -hmm. you know, maybe hard to hold on to hope and things when you're in that type of a situation. And he said he set a goal to run in this specific run that he had been doing since he was a child. It was a seven mile run. So he needed to get from critical care to being able to run this. He didn't focus on what am I going to do for the next five years and, you know, all of these big life decisions. He set one goal. And then even that, I'm sure he had to break down into small steps. I have to go to physical therapy today. So 
let me go to my appointment because I know what I'm heading toward. I'm just going to take one step. And I know you and I've talked about that concept in various ways as well. So I thought that one was useful. And kind of to summarize some of this, that really overall, our mental health is about a series of behaviors, our habits. And so doing the habits that support our mental health, getting the sleep, getting the exercise, physically doing activities, connecting with people. You and I have talked about the loneliness piece and the power of connecting with people. And she said basically doing these things and doing these resets can really help us unhook from the things that are holding us back and inch toward the things that we want our lives to stand for. Mm. I like that. Yeah, some really good tips there. And I think perspective is something that I underscored. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big thing, especially with mind and also with the others. But yeah, getting that different perspective, just getting out of the place you're in by doing some of these really quite simple and quick things. It lived up to its title, Soothe Stress in Minutes. Yeah. So yes, very good. <laughs> Very good. Well, I hope everyone can start practicing some of these right away. And if you find these useful, you may be interested in getting the book and learning there are 60 some others that you might also want to practice. Excellent. Well, until next week when it will be my turn to share something, I hope you have and everyone at home as well, of course, have a very wonderful week. Take good care, everybody. Bye.